It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Paul G. Matthew. Um, word anywhere in medicine. Um, so we should really be cautious when we read things like that. So for any Star Trek fans here, uh, can you handle this bones? Damage him. Starfleet terminated my contract because I did not buy my MOC modules on time. The real broke McCoy. So this is a timeline of really how things go. You graduate from medical school, you graduate from residency, you pass the boards. And depending on how old you are, you're either grandfathered for life or you're not grandfathered. And people seem to understand emojis better than spoken language. So I've translated this to emojis. The grandfathers were happy, not grandfathered sad, which led to more sadness, anger, even more sadness, fury, pumpkin sadness. I'm not sure I understand that emoji. And then absolutely being berserk about it. Now, emojis represent what we're supposed to feel like, but not what we look like until this physician came into my office very upset. So moving on. MOC to me is like a drug analogy. Uh, you would never release a drug to the market without testing safety and efficacy. Clearly that did not happen here. These were arbitrary requirements. Uh, so a lack of studies that justified the negative effects and the side effects here being time, money, burnout, and animosity. Uh, so this is really, once again, Marion Mass has spoken to this many times tonight. This is the tail wagging the dog where the boards are basically telling physicians what to do rather than physicians having a voice. So. You know, I've always said if a bureaucratic system cannot be reformed, then it should be replaced. And if bureaucratic administrators are ruining the practice of medicine, then physicians should take action. Uh, Dr. Secker has a comment here. Uh, that sounds like a plan. Unfortunately, our administrator is on a conference call with some other administrators discussing the need for more administrators. So an administrator will be available in case I call. And just to punctuate that point, this is real data that was published by one of my colleagues at the Cambridge Health Alliance. This is the growth of administrators over time. And these numbers would continue to escalate after 2012 if the chart continued on, while the yellow sliver that you can barely see is the growth of physicians. So when we hear people complaining about the lack of residency slots and how more need to be created, please keep this image in mind. So NBPS was created. So this is a organization, the National Board of Physicians and Surgeons that only deals in board recertification. So we believe in the value of an initial certification exam after you complete training, but really after that, your, your continued certification should be based on continuing to practice with a valid license, uh, that you've completed valid CME 50 hours over 24 months, uh, as well as holding clinical privileges if you're a proceduralist. Um, so, you know, this is not a group of random angry doctors. We have representatives from many different specialties on the board and, and many of the top institutions in the country. And again, we are all volunteers. Uh, none of us are salaried. Um, so, you know, when you look at nonprofits, they're, they're under great scrutiny nowadays, as they should be. So the ABIM, which is the American Board of Internal Medicine, which actually is the largest of the boards, uh, they lost $39.8 million uh, but during that same year, they actually had a, prop, a profit and paid out their senior officers $125.7 million. And the CEO of the American Board of Neurology and Psychiatry had a salary of $3 million when you look at compensation. And the other officers were all six figures. Uh, Dr. Agarwal has a comment here. Uh, that's a nice chunk of change. Are they looking for new board members? Well done. So I didn't believe this chart when I first saw it, uh, but I verified this with the uh, IRS 990 forms. These are the overseas holdings of the ABIM from 2015, totaling $6.5 million. Um, so where, when you wonder where's all this money going, apparently overseas accounts, and then what they're doing with that money thereafter, uh, God only knows. Uh, in this JAMA analysis, they detailed, you know, just how much money and profit they're really making over uh, expenses. And, and it's really egregious. Again, I'm just going to fly through these. Where's this money coming from? Um, in this piece from uh, Annal uh, Annals of Internal Medicine, they basically did a review of how much people spend in terms of uh, test prep material, travel, taking the exam, time off, uh, revenue loss from not seeing patients. And an internist in a 10-year cycle spent $16,725. And a multi-boarded specialist, like an oncologist in this example, $40,495 to comply with the 10-year cycle. So, uh, you know, it's really expensive when people say it's just the cost of the $2,000 exam. Uh, that, that's really not giving it the, the money that's really involved. And then some institutions are actually paying for this. 
Um, so one healthcare system, which will remain unnamed, if there's 1,200 physicians and they're paying $2,000 per physician, that's $2.4 million every 10 years. And that's just that one single institution. Multiply that by all the massive healthcare institutions throughout a country. It's a lot of money. Um, and again, this is $240,000 per year for this institution of 1,200 physicians. And again, that's money that should be spent on COVID-19, on the opioid crisis, on so many better things than feeding this bloated nonprofit organization that's clearly, uh, to use Marion's words, a parasite on, on the practice of medicine. Um, there was a journal club that was um, done by NBPS. We hired some independent reviewers. And it was amazing that the lack of evidence supporting uh, maintenance of certification, there was some scant evidence supporting initial certification, but when you look for MOC, really, there was not much out there supporting that it's useful. And I, and I love reading this line out loud. This is a, a publication that was written by Rebecca Lipner, who's one of the board members for the ABMS. In general, physicians who are board certified provide better patient care, albeit the results have modest effect sizes that are not unequivocal. What does not unequivocal mean? And how does this language actually make it into a peer reviewed journal? It, it's, it's absolutely amazing. And then on the other side, this was a study conducted at Mayo Clinic comparing quality measures between board uh, MOC compliant and non MOC compliant physicians. And they really found no significant difference on 10 primary care performance measures. I use this as an example of relevance. Um, I'll let Dr. Agarwal take a look at this one. Uh, what is this slide? Um, you know, usually when I'm addressing a neurology audience, it's, you can actually see tumbleweeds in the auditorium. And then I flip to this one, what is this? And then everyone's hands pop up saying that's clearly an acoustic neuroma. Yep, so this completely irrelevant to the practice of a neurologist, this very relevant. So why are we brute memorizing slides to pass an exam? It, it makes no sense at all. And there's examples of this that I hear all the time from colleagues. Why is a adult anesthesiologist having to learn pediatric intubation techniques? Uh, so on and so forth. Um, so many of you know that because of the pressure of the NBPAS, many of the boards, including the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology have invented this 2.0 program where instead of a 10 year high stakes exam, they give you a slew of journal articles. You then have to read them and take these mini quizzes, which sounds much better. Other boards are also following, this is the um, United Council of Neurological Specialties, which I, you know, I, I was a diplomat um, uh, for headache medicine. And they've, done, they've followed a similar model, but they're a little bit more egregious. Even if you have an unexpired certificate, they say, we're, we're sorry, we're not recognizing that your certificate has not yet expired. You have to comply and start paying immediately. Um, so although these two, you know, these two systems that are being employed of, you know, these open book quizzes and reading articles and so on and so forth, it, it sounds more reasonable. But I ask, why are we paying a tax to read articles that may not even interest us or, or be part of our practice? For example, why am I reading an article on complex neuromuscular disorders that I'm just never going to see in practice and, and answer questions about it? It, it, it is exactly that. It's a tax for an activity that, you know, you should be able to pick and choose what articles you want to read anyway. And, you know, what are the things we do anyway for passive learning? Reading articles, CME, discussing cases with colleagues, looking stuff up like on UpToDate, and passive learning. Uh, you know, the, the best form of learning, which many of you in the room will agree with, is actually seeing patients. Um, I don't care whether you're 20, 30, or 40 years into practice, you can learn little nuances about medicine um, just from seeing patients on a daily basis. So again, how are these MOCA 2.0 um, programs any more rigorous than NBPAS? Uh, they're not. And so their argument that they're making it easier for learners actually deflates their argument that it's any more pertinent in terms of being superior to NBPAS. So uh, because of the egregious nature of the UCNS, NBPAS started recertifying UCNS diplomates. And even more exciting, even hotter off the press, many of you may know this, the American Osteopathic Association, who does the board certification for many of our DO colleagues, um, they recently filed a lawsuit against the, ABP, uh, the ABMS. Basically, the ABMS said that a program director of a residency program needs to be MOC compliant, and so that would force DOs who are AOA compliant to then drop their certification with the AOA and join the ABMS, uh, which clearly is a, is a conflict, and that's why they're taking them to court. 
I will very quickly talk about the compact. This is one slide and one slide only. For those of you that don't know, the compact is an interstate agreement so that you can have a medical license covering multiple states. Sounds like a great idea, but the devil is always in the details and I'll share two with you. Um, one of them, the obvious one to me is the compact in most states defines a physician as someone who is ABMS MOC compliant. Now, currently there is no state in the entire United States that requires MOC compliance for a license, but this would be the first time that a compact would do something like this. And if this happens and the compact grows in steam, you may start seeing national licensure and that might be taken away from the states. And again, they would follow the compact rules and think, oh, an ABMS doctor is a doctor and otherwise you're not. Uh, the other issue which Debbie McIntyre um, brought to my attention is that if you, um, have any action taken against your license um, in the compact, there is not much room for, uh, you know, fighting this, this kind of action. So, and you might be hung out to dry in multiple states now. So really be careful when you hear about this compact and how, you know, aggressively people are supporting it. Uh, I want mutton to do with MOL, exactly, a wolf in sheep's clothing. All right, so, you know, people might think, oh, we have to get the leadership on board, but they are. Uh, the AMA has passed several resolutions saying that MOC should not be a requirement to practice, it shouldn't be tied to licensure, but unfortunately all that happens is resolutions are passed uh, and no meaningful action is actually taken um, on these issues. And even the Department of Justice, MBPS, approached them and the Department of Justice actually uh, wrote a piece explaining that the complete and utter lack of competition actually is very bad for the healthcare space. It stifles innovation and it actually is more costly for the healthcare system and that states should very carefully consider pro-competition legislation. So I've been pushing this, this uh, point in, in different state legislatures. Here's uh, some time I spent uh, in, in Massachusetts trying to push the bill here. And when the organization, the Massachusetts Medical Society that puts out the New England Journal of Medicine is the key sponsor of an MOC bill, you have to figure that, you know, it probably holds some credence and people should take it seriously. So here's me with one of the MMS leadership. Um, I'll keep going here. This is when I testified in New Hampshire on behalf of their bill. Uh, here's me in Virginia with Suja Amir, who's an outstanding champion for all different issues, including maintenance of certification reform. Uh, here's me in Rhode Island with former state Senator Jim Sheehan, who is a, a great colleague and, and uh, one of the few times I've actually gone to a political rally to, to support a candidate. Uh, here's Debbie McIntyre, who, who introduced herself earlier, who's really been a force in Rhode Island, and I'm so glad to have her as a colleague working on this. And uh, in case you were wondering, uh, I'm Debbie McIntyre, and I endorse this message. So um, just very quickly to wrap up. So the Rhode Island MOC bill, we've been pushing some pro-competition language, and the Rhode Island Medical Society opposed this, um, saying that ABMS is the gold standard, board certification should not be linked to licensure, um, and some other issues. And it's always great when you, take in, when you can take someone's points, turn them around so they behoove and fit you, and then send it back to them. And they respond by saying, we, we no longer oppose the bill based on the modifications to the language based on the points that we made opposing the bill. Um, so it's made its way out of committee. Uh, hopefully the House and Senate will vote favorably upon, uh, upon it and we'll get it on the governor's desk for signature soon. And then, you know, politics is like dominoes. If one state does it and it seems reasonable, other states follow. So just to wrap up, um, I support initial certification and BPS does too. Uh, we should really think about this when we're talking about pro-competition legislation because MOC is expensive, time-consuming, unproven, one size does not fit all, it reduces patient access to healthcare, it increases the cost of healthcare, and it contributes to physician burnout. And this $22.7 million headquarters for the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology should just remind you where this money's going. Um, and then things you can do. Uh, if you do become a diplomat of NBPS, which I encourage all of you to do, put DNBPS after your name. Again, as all of you know in this room, brand recognition is extremely important because as it's recognized, uh, it'll more likely weave its way into policy and acceptance. Um, support state level pro-competition legislation when it shows up and do take a look at the website if you're a practicing physician. I'm happy to take questions, but Uli apparently has the first question here. Uh, is board recertification going to affect non-physician providers? Uh, I hope this does not affect my acupuncturist. And then last but not least, a public service announcement. This is my social media campaign, which some of you have seen. Uh, COVID-19 vaccination, a strong decision. 
uh, we all need to do our part to encourage the public to really get vaccinated that sooner we'll be able to end masking and social distancing when the time is right, but that's only gonna happen with mass vaccination. So thank you so much for your time. I probably ran-